Red Dead Revolver is a western game where you play as a bounty hunter named Red Harlow. If you want to know more about him, click the card in the corner. This video is about every bounty and outlaw that there is in the game, so let's get into it. I'm going to make mince meat out of you! The Bloody Tom Gang Bloody Tom is the first boss fight of the game and the first bounty that we claim as good old Red Harlow. Tommy Boy here has a reputation of butchering not only livestock, but has since moved on into becoming an outlaw and butchering peoples. Bloody Tom's bounty is $250. He's wanted dead or alive by Sheriff Bartlett for murder and mayhem. Tom first made a name for himself by surviving a gang war where everyone else died but him. He lived only by hiding under the corpses of his fallen comrades. He has no interest in big targets like banks. He sticks to robbing and killing people on the road like traveling salesmen. We first encounter Bloody Tom and his gang after two members start harassing a friendly merchant along the road named Curly Shaw. These two thugs are Twiggy Phelps and Smitty. Twiggy Phelps is named so because he's thin as a twig. He had to order his gun belt special from the children's section of the mail order catalog. He is likely only still alive because of his thin target. He could take cover behind a yucca tree without turning sideways. Smitty is known only by that name, and that name is only known to the law because when he robs train cars with his buddies, they all holler out his name, blowing his cover. He has a $175 bounty on his head for robbery and murder, and he is wanted dead or alive. After Red kills these hooligans with ease while still learning how to use Deadeye, this is the first real level of the game after all, two burly outlaws emerge from nearby shacks, Greg Big Oaf Whitney and his son George Little Oaf Whitney. These are Tom's right and left hand men and they fight alongside him. Big Oaf and Little Oaf have bounties on their heads as well. Big Oaf is interestingly enough higher than Bloody Tom's bounty at $750 dead or alive. He is wanted for criminal mischief and murder. And Lil Oaf is the same as Tom at $250 dead or alive, wanted for accessory to murder. Not much is known about Big Oaf except his father was a medical doctor, which explains the rusty old medical equipment that Oaf likes to tinker with, particularly a bone saw. Lil Oaf was predictably named after his father, but has since been shortened to simply Loaf, which all works out since he isn't quite so little anymore. The boy likes to dig holes all day with a shovel, which works out in the gang's favor when they have a few things that they need to bury. Bloody Tom is the boss man of this group. He wears a bloodstained apron and gloves, and he carries a pistol called the Inquisitor, the third strongest pistol in the game, which is pretty good for a first boss fight. After Red kills Thomas and his gang, he takes their bodies to the nearby town of Widow's Patch to collect his bounty. Before we start talking about the next group of pesky ne'er-do-wells, let's talk about how you can stay safe from the modern version of them online using Atlas VPN, the sponsor of today's video. Atlas VPN is a virtual private network that makes all of your internet traffic travel through an encrypted tunnel, keeping you safe from any prying eyes. But Atlas is more than just a VPN. They block malicious links, ads, and trackers, and they notify you when someone is trying to steal your data. And beyond data security, Atlas can help you get the best deals possible online by avoiding any pricing alterations based on location. Many services adjust their pricing based on region by looking at cookies and IP addresses. These services can guess where you are, and with Atlas, you can adjust your location to avoid avoid these pricing manipulations and get great deals on airlines or hotels. Right now, you can get the best deal possible on Atlas VPN. Enjoy the most affordable online protection for just $1.39 a month for an unlimited amount of devices. That's like pocket change, pocket change that can save your online security on any device that can go online. And if Atlas VPN doesn't butter your biscuit, they offer a 30 day money back guarantee. Another fantastic thing I like to do with Atlas is to bypass location based restrictions on Netflix to watch all kinds of stuff not licensed to my region. That alone is worth the cost to me. I can hop on over to UK Netflix and watch some Rick and Morty or Brooklyn Nine-Nine. Again, right now, Atlas VPN is running a huge discount. It means you can get a three-year subscription for just $1.39 a month with a 30-day money-back guarantee. This deal is temporary, so jump on it by clicking the link in the video description below. Thank you, Atlas, for sponsoring today's video. Now, let's get on to the next group of bandits. Where are you running off to, Sheriff? You may have beaten my gang, but you ain't gonna get by me! The Ugly Gang After bringing in the corpses of Bloody Tom and his gang to the town of Widow's Patch, Red quickly discovers that this town is being run by another gang called the Ugly Gang, led by Ugly Chris Bailey. 
Ugly Chris has a bounty on his head for $350 for kidnapping, severe disturbances of the general peace, and suspicion of more than a dozen murders. Ugly Chris showed up shortly before Red to Widow's Patch and took control of the town from Sheriff O'Grady. Due to his size and intimidation factor, he attracted plenty of lowlifes to his side and amassed a small army of misfits and crooks. While in power of Widow's Patch, he doesn't kill the sheriff, and this may be due to the charm of the sheriff's daughter, Katie O'Grady, and Ugly Chris. Chris's attempts to win her affection. Instead of the gang harassing a traveling merchant like the Bloody Tom gang, the Ugly gang introduces themselves to Red by killing his dog. Let that damn dog go and leave himself all over them fancy boots here. <laughs> damn varmint! The man who shoots the dog is Udo Kang. He's wanted dead or alive with a $50 reward for the crime of murder and mayhem. Sheriff Bartlett regards Kang as one of the most sadistic characters that he's ever met. He's a pretty short fellow, but he makes up for it by being mean as hell and fighting dirty. Kang is put down quickly after he made the mistake of shooting Red's dog. Another man named Jacques Marcus takes the high ground position in Widow's Patch to shoot down at Red. Jacques is wanted dead or alive at a price of $50 for assassination of legal claim holders and theft of gold dust and gold nuggets. He used to be a skilled hunter, particularly at killing moose before turning to a life of crime. The next few men are all officers within the ugly gang, all with bounties of their own that take a shot at killing Red before Chris himself gets involved. The first being Chicken. With a dead or alive bounty of $125 for murder and moral turpitude. Chicken is named so because he prefers the company of Fowl, but also because he loves to take cover when it's time to fight. Next up is Hedgehog Thornton. There's a $100 bounty on his head for mayhem and murder. Hedgehog is often regarded as one of the ugliest members of the Ugly Gang, and I truly hope that he prides himself on that achievement. He isn't too feisty, though he has a shotgun that can do some damage up close. After the spiny mammal comes Whiskey a troubled child that left the orphanage he grew up in after becoming too old and drinking too much whiskey. His favorite brand of whiskey being Old Devil Shootin' and Robin Whiskey from Helltown Distillery. What a name. Whiskey has no known bounty in Sheriff Bartlett's journal, but he is no doubt a misfit getting involved with Ugly Chris. Whiskey gets his death from Red while he learns how to use the duel mechanic in the game. Poor guy dies by a demonstration. And the last of the gang officers comes Charlie Gigolo Hancock, with a whopping $25 bounty for suspected manslaughter. He is rumored to have killed a drunk old gunslinger in his sleep to impress Ugly Chris. He acts mighty feisty, but he's as cowardly as they come. And finally, Ugly Chris himself. He picks up Sheriff O'Grady and runs around using him as cover in his fight with Red. Shooting Christopher in the foot usually gets the job done though. After the gunfight, Sheriff O'Grady still ends up injured, and Red does the kind thing and escorts him to Brimstone. Now this here's a robbery. Nobody plays hero, nobody dies. The Pedrosa Brothers. The Pedrosa brothers are a primarily Mexican gang known for robbing train cars so much that the conductor of the train has written pleas to the sheriff to stop them. They are led by the two Pedrosa brothers, Rico and Roberto. Rico and his brother have been terrorists since children in their native town in rural Mexico, until they caught the attention of the Federales and fled north to the US. You come across the Pedrosa brothers on a train car from Widow's Patch to Brimstone when they attempt to rob it. The first man you meet is actually Roberto Pedrosa. He jumps out of his seat and challenges Red to a duel. Roberto has a $300 dead or alive bounty on his head for crimes too numerous to list. There's a rumor that Roberto likes to read, or at least he likes to read one book in particular, Moby Dick. He reads it over and over, and some speculate that maybe he identifies with the whale in the story. Nonetheless, he is put down by Red in their duel in the train car. The next three Pedrosa members you encounter are Smiley Fowler, Harry Hatchet Schultz, and Hoss, three bandana wearing bandits. Smiley has a white bandana and he's found in the back of the train car. He has a proficiency in throwing knives and he prefers to let others do the heavy lifting. Hoss is wearing a red bandana and he's holding the train engineer hostage when you find him. He's really just the same character as Smiley, just different colored bandanas. And while neither Smiley nor Hoss have known bounties on their head, Harry Hatchet Schultz absolutely did. $500 dead or alive, wanted for the chopping of things that he shouldn't. He wears a black bandana and he jumps on the train from horseback. Harry used to get punished as a kid and made to chop wood for hours, being taunted by his brothers and sisters while he was doing so. By the time he was 15, not a single tree stood within miles of his family's cabin, and he has just been hacking at life ever since. 
Another man encountered along the train car is Juan Loco Sanchez, a notorious train robber who on his last day just happened to be riding with the Pedrosa brothers. He always covers his face with a bandana, but he's known mostly for his crazy eyes. He's wanted dead or alive for robbery and murder with a reward of $250. Rico Pedrosa never actually appears in the game, but he does have a bounty on his head for $300 for crimes too numerous to list. According to rumor, Rico was once left out in the sun, staked to the ground for three days by his brother brother Roberto as a joke. Nothing says brotherly love like crucifixion. Time for a little pick-me-up, I think. My boys will keep you busy. Professor Perry's Peculiarities Professor Perry and his circus of peculiarities is one of the largest gangs within Red Dead Revolver. Perry is the leader and operator of the circus, after it is assumed that he killed the prior owner named Preston O'Leary. Since his leadership, the circus has become full of misfits and troublemakers. The first of which you meet is Pig Josh. You're gonna blow up Pig Josh was a demolition expert in the Civil War, although we don't actually know which side he was on. Needless to say, he is skilled with dynamite and it is his go-to when it comes to killing. He was once part of Perry's circus, amazing crowds with his pyrotechnics, but he has since left and become an outlaw all on his own. Pig Josh is likely a reference to the game that Revolver was loosely based on. Gunsmoke, with the character Pig Joe, another fat and shirtless man fond of dynamite. Pig Josh fights along with dwarf clowns called Fidgets, which are rumored to be the offspring of Pig Josh and one Bat Lady, a former member of the circus, but are now all employed under Professor Perry. After Red defeats Pig Josh for his bounty, it is actually Jack Swift who moves on and fights the rest of Perry's circus after they fled to the remains of Widow's Patch once Ugly Chris moved out, and they tied up the sheriff's daughter, Katie O'Grady, in the middle of town. Clyde the Blade Slade is the first guy you tussle with. Slade is one of only two original members of the circus that stayed after Perry took charge. He was actually on the fence with getting fired for quote unquote missing too much in his knife axe, hitting one too many assistants. Needless to say, he has a liking for throwing knives, but who knows if he was just trying to scare Jack here or if his aim is just really that bad. The other holdover from O'Leary's circus days is Lightning LaRouche, a fire breather with an unhealthy obsession with fire. He is Perry's right hand man and is useful with intimidating customers to buy some potions from Perry. During his fight with Jack, if you get too close he'll use his blowtorch and fire breathing skills to toast you. Asada is another carny in the circus, which may well mean that his name is a joke, you know, carne asada. He dresses real fancy and he loses money just as fast as he makes it. The strongman of the circus also shows his face, one Atlas Jones. He is a hulking beast of a man who serves as Perry's bodyguard. In the fight with Jack Swift, he doesn't really attack unless he gets close and he walks around with a shield. He's known to carry brass knuckles with him wherever he goes, not that he needs them or anything. And last up is the leader of this circus, quite literally, Professor Perry and his miracle elixir. He is known as a mad scientist of sorts, most notable for making his one and only concoction deemed Miracle Elixir, which regenerates his health and allows him to seemingly teleport from location to location. Jack is the one that came to fight Perry because he was in fact employed by the circus acts before attempting to part ways and getting captured instead. Jack Swift makes quick work of Professor Perry in their fight and has effectively stopped the traveling circus from committing more crimes. I can hear you coming, little man. You think you can handle taking on a woman like me? The Bad Bessie Gang. The one and only woman bounty Red sets his sights on is none other than Bad Bessie. Bad Bessie is holed up in Rogue Valley with her bodyguards and is wanted in Brimstone, dead or alive, for grand theft and murder with a price of $500 on her head. She used to be a showgirl in the saloon in Brimstone and flaunted around a pretty impressive routine with her trusty whip. However, she grew tired of patrons making fun of her, so she decided to steal the saloon's money and live a life of crime. She used to make a killing from the dance halls and saloons and now, well, she's just when you fight Bad Bessie, you're also faced with her bodyguards, most notably one Sidney Sissy Fess. Sissy has a bounty on his head for the price of $120 for assault, battery, and murder. During the fight with Bad Bessie while she's attempting to whip Red into submission, Sissy is throwing large boulders in an attempt to knock Red off of his feet. The man likes to throw boulders around, and it's rumored that he only holed up with Bessie in Rogue Valley because the amount of rocks that there are to toss about. The name Sissy, in combination with his last name, Fess, may be a little reference to the Greek legend 
origin of Sisyphus, a king who was punished by Hades to roll a heavy boulder uphill that would roll back down once he was finished, causing an endless loop for all of eternity. Bad Bessie is one of the few characters in Revolver mentioned at campfire stories in the Redemption games, often being praised as the toughest woman on the frontier, killing plenty of men with her signature whip. Hate to kill a lady. <laughs> the Black Gang The final bounty that Red gets assigned in Brimstone is Mr. Black, leader of the Black Gang. The Black Gang is a group of rowdy bandits who have taken over the town of Tarnation, making all the residents flee, leaving only a ghost town behind. Red first arrives in the town and is confronted with many thugs to kill, including Bob Larson. A mysterious mustache man wanted dead or alive for grand larceny and murder, with the price of $300 on his head. After killing all of these men in the ghost town, Red sets up a duel with three notable members of the Black Gang. Jesse Lynch, a unique and frightening looking man, heads the duel. Jesse has the largest bounty award in the game on his head, at the amount of $800. This is likely due to the fact that he was captured before on a prior bounty and was sentenced to hang for being caught red-handed at the scene of the McDonald massacre. It wasn't until the next morning that Jesse was missing, and the sheriff thought that someone may have swiped the body, until a man matching Jesse's description held up a stagecoach and fled to Tarnation. He still wears the noose around his neck. On Mr. Lynch's flanks are Bandito and Gordon Diggs Fowler. Bandito is a man wanted for robbing the Brimstone Bank. He is identified not just by his bandana with a smile on it, but mostly by his stench. The bank manager even stated that he hopes that he at least spent some of the money on buying a bath. Gordon Diggs Fowler, named Diggs by the way that he digs into every bit of food that he can, or perhaps the way that he digs into people's chests with his pickaxe. The sheriff is unsure which, but he is a dirty son of a gun either way. There is no bounty posted on him at the time of his death, however. After the duel, Red runs up to the cemetery where he confronts the leader of this creepy little gang, Mr. Black. Mr. Black is a strange bird. Some aren't even sure if he's actually alive, which is probably why his bounty doesn't have him as dead or alive and simply just wants him as dead as possible for $500 for the crime of mass murder. He was the undertaker in the town of Tarnation, and although plenty of folks eventually fled the town, many of them met untimely fates and gave profitable work to Mr. Black in his trade. It's all but been confirmed that he's been killing for many, many years. Black carries around a coffin on his back that holds a Gatling gun that he uses to try to stop Red from collecting his bounty, but unfortunately for him, Red got the better of him, leaving him to fall into his own coffin. Mr. Black may be a reference to Django, the 1966 spaghetti western, where he pulls a Gatling gun from a coffin to cut down his foes. Django is played by Mr. Franco Nero, Nero being the Italian word for black. Mr. Black is also mentioned at various campfire stories in Red Dead Redemption. I got something for you! Come out and play! <laughs> the Holstein Brothers. Annie Stokes is the character that gets the lucky opportunity to fight with two Holstein brothers, Hal Holstein and his little brother Luke Longhorn. They both have bounties on their head, but even the sheriff admits that it's just for show because these two brothers are hired mercenaries for Governor Griffin, who is the sheriff's boss as well. Hal has a bounty posted for $500 for harassment and rustling, which is cattle theft according to Google, and Luke has one posted at $500 for harassment and murder. Hal is a notorious cattle thief. He is dumb as rocks, so since he can't manage to raise his own cattle, he takes them from honest people. Longhorn Luke used to be a legendary buffalo hunter and a frontiersman, but when the buffalo population dwindled, he had to find another way to make money with his gun and his lasso. So he paired up with his brother and took up mercenary work under Governor Griffin, stealing cattle and being an overall nuisance to honest people. Annie Stokes ends up killing both of these brothers after they storm her ranch on the back of buffaloes. Ain't that right, Sam? I reckon so. Say goodbye, mister. The Saloon Brothers. Okay, so the Saloon Brothers aren't their actual names, but I just call them that because they spend all of their time in the Brimstone Saloon. But I'm talking about the men only known as Dan and Sam. 
Another two men who constantly get pardoned of their bounties because they are hired muscle under Governor Griffin. Sam and Dan may also be a reference to Sam and Dan Hauser of Rockstar Games. Dan is first seen by Red in the saloon once he starts gossiping about a one-armed man named Colonel Darren. Red has an interest in this and starts a brawl whilst trying to get some information. Dan, also known as Dapper Dan, is wanted dead or alive for murder and mayhem with a price of $500 on his head. Dan lives in the shadow of his bigger and older brother, but that doesn't make him any less feisty. And one of his pet peeves is people who don't mind their business, and in this case, that'd be Red. He challenges Red to a duel and of course dies at the hand of the protagonist and right in front of his older brother, Sam. Sam is one mean son of a gun. He is larger, stronger, and meaner than any other bounty out there except maybe Pig Josh. He is wanted for the same bounty and charges as his brother, murder and mayhem for $500. He's also known to be very popular among the ladies of Brimstone Saloon. They can't seem to get enough of him. His name may also be a reference to Yosemite Sam as his appearance of a stocky figure, large hat, and beard make him resemble the cartoon in a way. Sam has a unique way of fighting in which he charges like a bull at his opponents, launching them into the air if he hits them. Sam and Dan are both killed by Red in the saloon, resulting in Red getting arrested by Sheriff Bartlett because he caused the brawl to begin with. The Black Elk Tribe the Black Elk Tribe is a tribe of Native Americans that occupy the area of Bear Mountain. They were hired by General Diego, in fact, to guard the gold mine at that location. There's a long-standing feud between the Black Elk Tribe and the Red Wolf Tribe of Native Americans. The Red Wolf Tribe, of course, being the tribe of Shadow Wolf, Falling Star, and by relation, Red Harlow, under the command of Chief Running Moon. The feud between the tribes has only been amplified since Black Elks have started working with Diego because they defiled the sacred burial runes of the Red Wolf tribe at Bear Mountain. There are two primary members of the Black Elk tribe, the first being Standing Snake, a high-ranking member of the tribe, and the second being Grizzly the chief of the Black Elks. Standing Snake, after the tribe's deal with Diego, has taken a co-leadership with Grizzly in running the tribe. Standing Snake left responsible for covering Hell Pass, a narrow path running along the floor of a canyon. Standing Snake is never actually killed in the game. He is one of the Native Americans in pursuit of Buffalo Soldier as he tries to make his way back to Brimstone. And while there's no bounty on his head, he is considered an outlaw in 12 states, according to Sheriff Bartlett. Grizzly, the de facto chieftain of the Black Elk tribe, was tasked by Diego to guard the mine at Bear Mountain himself. He is the one that held the keys to the holding cell that Red Harlow and Buffalo Soldier were held in. He is also tasked with motivating the slave workers in the mine to work harder and faster by any means necessary. He is an aggressive and very primal fighter. Like his name suggests, he's also very bear-like. He wields bear claw knives on his hands that are poisoned with snake oil. He even manages to roar like a bear when in battle, and no one really knows how he does it. He's also able to jump unnaturally high on top of totems. He is never heard speaking in the game, although since he has made a collaboration with General Diego in exchange for gold, it's assumed that he can speak, or at the very least, communicate effectively. He does not have a bounty on him in this game for unknown reasons, but he stands in the way of Shadow Wolf on his way to get to Red, so regardless, he is put down. It is far from over, gringo! The Renegade Army the Renegade Army is a group of glorified bandits formed by former Mexican General Javier Diego. The army is made up of former soldiers of many countries who all now work under Governor Griffin and control the gold mine in Bear Mountain. The army is also in collaboration with the Black Elk Tribe, using them for protection of mine operations. It is also of note that none of the members of this gang have bounties because they all fall under the protection of the corrupt Governor Griffin, deeming them pretty untouchable by the law. Inside the mine of Bear Mountain, there are plenty of guards, but three men in particular Red has a duel with after being released from his cell, Private Eli Hansen, Sergio, and Ennio, all three being named after people linked to the 1966 Western film The Good, The Bad, and The Ugly. Eli being a reference to Eli Wallach, who played The Ugly in the film, Sergio referencing Sergio Leone, the director of the film, and Ennio referencing Ennio Morricone, the composer of the film's music. Private Hansen is one of the most loyal soldiers in the army, and he simply just does as he's told for a few bucks a month. Sergio is also known as the duelist, and not only because he likes to duel, but because he typically dual wields his revolvers. He is a hired guard in the mine and has an expertise in pest control. And not much is known of Ennio, he's just another hired gun in the army. All three of them get killed all the same by Red in a duel. 
Another man encountered within the mine is Pickaxe Miller, a man who loves his pickaxe. He even sleeps with it. He was a miner working in Bear Mountain for over 10 years, but has since been put on the payroll of the Renegade Army just because he is so damn proficient with his axe. He is seen charging at Red with his trusty weapon. Private Ripper Hernandez is another man seen within the mine itself. We have even seen him before during a flashback with General Diego. Ripper is known to be a very sadistic individual who enjoys using razor tipped army boots to kick his enemies to death. He even once kicked Pickaxe Miller once during an argument resulting in a wound requiring 20 stitches to close. Before leaving the mine for good, Red encounters Captain Ted Bufius and the medic known as Tony. Captain Bufius is a cold hearted man known to enjoy killing the strong and weak alike showing no mercy for either. He once killed a man for laughing at his stained boots and then he used the corpse as a footrest, probably the situation that got them stained in the first place. Tony is a skilled medic and during the fight with Red alongside his buddy Ted, he will use healing tonics if Ted gets too injured to keep him in the fight. He is also very skilled at throwing Molotov cocktails. Outside of the mine, Red attacks and kills the last high-ranking members of the army. The first is Colonel Darren. Colonel Darren is General Diego's right-hand man. He is also the man that killed Red's mother and father and had his arm shot off by a young Red. We see him at several points in the game before we actually get to fight him. After losing his arm, Diego paid out of his own pocket to buy the best replacement for his trusty sidekick, a compact shoulder mounted mortar gun. Darren is confronted at Fort Diego by Red and Shadow Wolf, where he kills Shadow Wolf in battle before or being bested by Red. Red avenges his cousin by using Shadow Wolf's knife to deliver the killing blow to Darren. Darren is also longtime friends with Dapper Dan from Brimstone Saloon, according to the story that Dan is telling at the table. Lieutenant Clue is a presumed French officer working with the Renegade Army and is encountered at last with Diego and his armored stagecoach. He is an excellent marksman and enjoys taking something personal from the bodies of people that he snipes. To him, it's like taking a piece of his victim's soul. Pictured in Sheriff Bartlett's journal is a locket that he may have taken from one of the people that he's killed. The locket is a gift from a wife to her husband. Clue is seen in the flashback with Diego at the bridge and at Sunset Canyon where Red destroys one of the army stagecoaches, but Red finally gets to kill him when he tries to stop him from storming Diego's train. And last but not least is General Javier Diego himself, the leader of the Renegade Army. He is the former general of the Mexican army before forming his own military group. He first learned of gold in Bear Mountain by a prospector named Griff, and then went on to kill Griff's partner to keep the gold for themselves. Griff's partner was Nate Harlow, Red's father. Griff ended up becoming the governor and continued his shady practices in partnership with Diego, getting wealthy off the gold in Bear Mountain. Diego has claimed an abandoned fort and named it after himself, as well as constructed a heavily armored train car to travel around in. He is killed by Red, even though he pleads for his life, tempting Red with whatever he may want in return for sparing him. Although, as we know, for Red, it never was about the money. Whiskey. Women. Fine weapons, anything you want. What do you say, partner? And that's all the outlaws and bandits that Red faces in the game. There is the Battle Royale contestants, but none of them are really outlaws. And then there's the men that protect the governor, the Cornette brothers, and one Mr. Kelly. But honestly, they are just like Governor Griffin himself and not all that interesting. So I'm just going to leave them out of this video. I didn't know 80% of these people had names or backstories when I first played this game. But since I've unlocked all the journal entries, it's pretty mind blowing how much backstory and lore that there is in this game. So I hope you find all this as interesting interesting as I did, and if you'd like to see any other Red Dead content, just let me know. As always, I hope to see you next time. Peace.